Uh, yeah, and I'm Christy Lukes, and I didn't say I uh, recently promoted to full teaching professor. And I've been here for five years, but I've been teaching for 25 years uh, previously at the University of Tulsa. So Steph and I were going to go over some of what the policies are right now. And these are in your handouts there. The first three pa packets of information are sort of general information. And uh, so what you should see in there is a UN system collective rules and regulations, the CRR 310.035, which pertains to non-tenure track faculty. And some of that pertains specifically to promotions, and there's a lot of other good information in there. If you haven't looked at it before, you ought to. Um, then there's the Chancellor's Policy Memoranda 11, or I guess it's II 13. 2-13. Two, yes. that's a 2. It's okay. a 2, 2-13. All right. And I haven't looked at, obviously, any of those things other than this one document. Uh, and that's more specific to how the college or the college, the university does things. You also then have another document that we'll talk about in just a moment, which, um, and then there's some department policies, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But, so what that CRR 310.035 does is it uh, goes through a lot of things about non-tenure track faculty, so it defines what is a regular faculty and what's non-regular and if you are in this room at this moment I think you're non-regular. We all need x lax or something apparently. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why they call us that but that's what it is. <laughs> so um, and non-regular includes those of us who are like teaching faculty or research faculty but it also includes a lot of other uh, unranged positions and some other like adjuncts things like that. Um, the categories of ranked MTT faculty are research and teaching, which are most of us. Uh, we have one professional practice MTT faculty on campus that I know of. Uh, and then I don't think we have any in categories four through six. No. Those are mostly like the, for the medical school at Mizzou and things like that. Yeah, Stephanie's been here a long time, so she knows this stuff. And somehow I just said, I'll present this. Sure, why not? Works for me, I'll just jump in. She's going to fill in and correct anything when I make a mistake. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just explain. Um, but, okay, so in here, two of the things that pertain to us today for our topic is how performance is evaluated and then how this relates to promotion. And so the key thing here is that the performance should be evaluated only on your primary area of responsibility. So if you're a teaching faculty, it should be on teaching. If you are a research faculty, it should be on research. It doesn't mean that you can't do the other activity, but that should not be an area of performance review. Um, and then, of course, service and professional activities also are included in there. Yeah, there's really good reason for this. This is mostly because we don't want departments to abuse NTT faculty and expect them to do the same things as a tenure track faculty does for less money. So that's why this is in place. And it doesn't keep you from doing the other things. Just be aware that they can't evaluate you on all three. Um, so every department is supposed to have developed some guidelines for how they're going to evaluate MTT faculty. That may or may not have happened. I, I actually, I know that that hasn't happened in all departments, um, but most have something on hand. Um, and again, it only can cover those primary areas of responsibility. Now, you're supposed to be having an annual review. I don't know if that happens in every department, but you are supposed to get a formal annual review and a formal written evaluation that goes along with that. And you are expected to compile a dossier, just like the other faculty do. Um, but then it also talks in this document about promotion. And it outlines some specific criteria for promotion in here and describes the process in kind of general terms at this point. Uh, but it's going to go through the college and the department, and then it's going to go up to the provost for approval there. Um, <clears throat> you should, before you are ready to go up for promotion, during those annual 
performance reviews, you ought to be talking to your department chair or whoever's doing those reviews about whether or not you're promotion ready and what it would take to get you there. So that should be a portion of those reviews, just like it should be for tenure track faculty, for instance. Um, yeah, again, once again, it's supposed to only focus on your primary area of, uh, that you were hired for. And it should look at total contributions, okay, over a sustained period of time. So probably while you were here, but like in my case, it also included some time before I arrived at the uh, Missouri s and um, If you've had any changes in job duties and so forth, those should be reflected in this promotion process. There's going to be various faculty committees that are involved in this, okay, at your department level and at the uh, university level. And they will involve both non-tenured track faculty and tenured faculty. Okay. Also, be aware that you're not required to go up for promotion. You can stay at your current rank yeah. if that's what you prefer. And if you do go up for promotion and it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean that you're fired. It just means that you didn't get promoted. So they can't revoke any contract based Very on Very good point. <laughs> okay, so then the uh, Chancellor's Policy Memorandum. This one gives a little bit more detail because this is university specific. So the other one was system. This is the university. Uh, it says that you have to reside in a faculty, in a department, okay, and that non-tenure track faculty with primary authority in research or teaching should receive title change to ranked NTT positions. I think mostly both colleges have adhered to that. There are still a few folks out there who are maybe called instructor and aren't part of the NTT ranked faculty, but those are things that we work on a lot and try to get people in the correct title positions so they get the opportunities they should have. Yeah. And this document then specifically refers to research faculty and teaching faculty at the full professor, associate professor, and assistant professor rankings. Um, there are some guidelines that are basically the same as the CRR, but they also say that there are other activities in addition to the primary role shall not be considered in performance evaluation. So they are very, very clear. So if you are teaching faculty and you also do a little research on the side, that's fine, but that doesn't go into your uh, performance evaluations or ultimately for your uh, promotions. And is service excluded from that? No, service, no, service and professional activities are still included. Okay. Um, the promotion is the same as the CRR, except they also add um, some general criteria, okay, and that each department is supposed to develop their specific rules. And they do a little bit more about the policies of how we're going to go through the approval process there. Okay? You are going to have to go through a review, review process that's both at your department level and at the campus level. Depending on your department, one of the two of those might seem more scary to you. Okay? I have to say that in my department, because we were creating the rules as I was doing it, I think that the, my department was probably the most terrifying thing I had to face because they didn't have a clue what they were doing and they kept arguing that are you sure this is the right thing to do? I think most of the time for most of you, <laughs> this shouldn't be a scary process. <laughs> this should, if you're going up for promotion, you should be pretty confident that you are deserving of that promotion right. and you should be able to justify that. So you should feel, feel pretty comfortable going ahead and putting things forward, I, should, I would hope. Yeah, my um, department didn't know whether or not they hadn't done it before. Yeah. So. One thing that I would like to note is that sometimes you're going to maybe hear of a tenure track person who wants to switch tracks into non-tenure track. And according to the, this particular document, they're not really supposed to do that, at least not at the end game stage. So we shouldn't have people in this group, really, who were intending to be going up for tenure or maybe went up for tenure and didn't get it and so they might consider this the booby prize. That's written in so that that's not supposed to happen. If they do decide, hey, you know what, I'm spending all of my time teaching, I'm in year three of my tenure track position, 
I really just want to do the teaching side more than the research side. If it's early on, they can do something about changing their title to non-tenure track. But if it's right before they're going up for tenure and they're scared they're not going to get it, they are not supposed to be switching tracks. And so that's part of this policy document. Just so you guys are aware, if anything funky goes on in your department, you should talk to your department chair, your dean, whatever. Okay, so this third document is the Missouri s and Promotion Procedures for MTT Faculty as approved by the Faculty Senate. This one has the most specific rules. So the other stuff is kind of general procedures. This one is very specific, okay? So it's going to outline vaguely department procedures and campus level procedures. The campus level procedures are very well uh, stated in there. And it's going to define what the appeals process is and any policies related to that. So that's probably the document that you most closely want to look at, as well as whatever you have at the department level. So at the department level, every department is supposed to have a review procedure, okay? And it is supposed to be available to all faculty in that department, okay? Those that I could find that were related to people who RSVP'd for today's event, those are in your packets, okay? If it's not in there, it means I couldn't find it, okay? But that doesn't mean it's not available to you. It may be in something that I just don't have access to. Uh, so that should be available, and if it isn't, then that needs to be the first step. You need to make sure that gets corrected. Do any of you guys not have that available in your department? So which department is it? Oh, uh, Electrical Computer Engineering. Okay. Uh, my position. All right. It's different than we're going to Okay, so yeah, you guys need to update that. Right. And material science does not have a department specific. What they list as their material science department specific uh, is just a copy of the CRR. Yeah. Right, and some departments have done that. So if you look at your department document <laughs> and it's not helpful at all and doesn't really describe the process, then let one of us know and we can provide you with some other department's documents so that maybe you can take Actually, the initiative. You now have a whole bunch of those, but yeah. yeah. And I've been through the process of helping my department create this. I know that you did it with yours. Mm -hmm. So there are many of us who can help you with that. Um, but again, so the evaluation, it needs to be spelled out that it's only supposed to be on your area that you were hired for. Okay, so teaching or research plus service and professional activities. Um, now what's going to happen is you're going to put together a dossier, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, uh, and then that's going to go to the department promotion committee, which may or may not be the same as the, you know, regular p &T committee for your department, okay? And then they're going to make a recommendation to the department chair, who then makes a recommendation to the campus level, which has some interesting has spelling there. Yes, it does. I don't know. It's old stuff, so find me, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, at the campus level, uh, there's a review committee that is composed of the regular p &T committee subset and some NTT faculty. And the rules are very confusing and almost non-workable because it requires that there should be three research faculty and three teaching faculty elected to this for a period of two years. And I don't know that we've had... We have had elections in the past. Um, the issue is that we want to get the folks on this committee to be at the highest possible rank because this involves people who are coming up to the highest possible rank and you only want people at rank or higher to vote on those coming up. Did that make sense? Okay. So we want to get teaching professors, research professors on this group. If we have somebody who's associate, they can't vote on somebody who's going up for full. So it's best to get full folks on there, and there haven't been that many of us. How many are there? I think right there's now, front, yeah, there's Scott and you and me and Eric and Katie Shannon in biology and uh, yeah, physics. Physics, yeah. Agnes in Agnes. physics. Yes. And who else did you say, Scott? Or not Jeff Tom. No. No, he's not. No, that one's not. I think there's somebody in um, English. 
And we want six of them on this. Three All right, and we need three B search, which is really. I don't low. think I don't know if we have those. So what happens is we start turning to other sources. Like if we're short a full teaching professor, we might look to a tenured person who is a distinguished curator's teaching professor. So that's possible that we could backfill with that. But once we get to critical mass, this will start working better. Yeah. Um, and then the chairs of the college PNT committees are the co-chairs of this committee, right? Okay. Uh, you're going to be represented by the chair of your department committee that's going to uh, represent you and participate in these deliberations, but they don't have a vote. Okay? They're just there to present your case for you. Um, what's going to happen at that campus review committee is their first order of business is supposed to be that they ascertain that the department indeed followed all the proper rules. Okay, so they followed the rules that were within the department and that the department rules were meeting the university rules. And then they follow it up with checking through the dossier and making sure that you really did meet the criterion for promotion. So again, they're looking at research or teaching and then they're looking at service and professional activities. And then they'll vote on that and then provide a narrative that outlines why they voted the way they did and then that goes up to the D. Okay. That's going to get kind of boring at this point because the dean's going to re review all that data and make his own decision and then advise the committee, candidate the recommendation of the committee and then whatever action he's taking and then forward that to the provost who's going to do the same thing. Um, he's going to review the recommendations, advise the committee of what action he's taken and the committee took and then send that on up to the chancellor who's going to do the same thing except for there's no more passing the buck. Okay. Now the one additional thing that the provost does is he sets the initial calendar for this. And this is the calendar for this year. Um, so October 14th, if you are wanting to do promotion this year, you need to let your department chair know, okay, so that they can let the provost know. And then the next week the provost is supposed to let those people know what uh, they need in the dossier. Okay. Um, before February 3rd, the candidate has to give the compile your dossier, give it to your department, they review it, they vote, they pass it on to the department chair, who then passes it on to the uh, campus committee. Okay? And so all of that is supposed to happen by February 3rd. In my department, we set a department timeline, so all of that will be... The candidate will be done doing their part by Christmas. Yeah, and I think mine is slightly earlier than yours. It's like December 1st-ish or something like that. Um, but, so this would be your busy time, and then after that it's just a matter of sitting back and just waiting, answering a question if someone has anything. Um, the campus committee is supposed to finish up by March 2nd, the dean by March 30th, the provost by April 13th, and May 4th, the chancellor is supposed to announce the decisions to the candidates. And then you get promoted effective September 1st of the next year. Okay? And it may or may not ever be announced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can get back to the previous page? Uh-huh. So October 14th is the due date for just sending the names. Yes. So, you just have to declare intent. Because I was looking at the provost website. Mm -hmm. uh, No, 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 no. You may have been looking at tenure track candidates, perhaps? Yeah, ours is, There's ours is different. Different. Ours later. Uh, whatever your department policies are should be available in your from your department chair. I have a lot of them uh, effective a year ago in this packet here. And I did that mostly because I think that what I mostly want us to do is spend some time going through and looking at those. I'm going to take a moment and pull up the my dossier just so you can see what's going to go into that. Okay, so I'm going to have to sit because to read that, I need to sit. Okay, so 
Item A is a title page. Right. What happens when your chair sends your name forward to the provost office saying this person wants to go out for promotion? Is you get on this list and then you get sent information about how all this works. And they'll have all these pieces. Some of these are going to be fillable forms and they're all lettered out A, B, C, D. Right. So this is or item A. All you have to do is put your name and your department on there. Okay? That's an easy one. Yeah. It does get a little harder from there. But not <laughs> most of the stuff you're going to have. Right. So um, they send you all this stuff. A lot of it is fillable forms, but then there's the big chunks. Yeah. So then there's you know this thing about the, where they're going to come in and take notes of what their action is that gets passed up from level to level. When you submit your dossier, it's going to be a bunch of these little documents put in a file and just sent to your chair. And they fill in some of the extra stuff that's not for you to fill in. Um, you need a CV, so I've got my CV. You need a teaching statement. So I did a teaching self-assessment plus evaluations and teaching load summary. Okay. Um, a service, so I did a service self-assessment, plus a summary of items that I've done for that. Now, a lot of this is completely non-standard. You get to make up how you want to present yourself. Yeah. And it, it has a lot to do with what sorts of things you're doing in your particular position. Like in mathematics, we coordinate large courses and supervise other instructors. And that may not be something that happens in other departments. So we have a whole sheet for that, and I've got a template if people want to use it. But you can make up your own way to present your CV and your own way to make your teaching statement. Some departments will have a stipulation on the number of pages in your dossier, so keep an eye out for that and see if it's in your department document. I know ours does, but it excludes some large items. So Now I found this actually item R to be the easiest one to fill out because <laughs> just I just it. checked a box there. But if you are teaching short courses or activities like that, then this will be a bigger deal to fill out. Mine was easy. And then supplemental, and so I did just random certificates and letters of recommendation or letters of thanks and stuff like that that I received from people. Uh, just kind of whatever else you felt like you wanted to include, but it didn't fit in anywhere else. That's supplemental. So you'll notice that not all the letters of the alphabet are used. They are, but they aren't going to necessarily pertain to you. So like teaching, P wouldn't pertain to a research faculty member, okay? But they're going to have another one, and I don't remember what the letter of the alphabet was, but it's for research. There are also some letters that aren't for any of us, like maybe D or something is the chair's narrative. Well, you don't write that, you don't right. see that. That goes to the committee to look yeah. at. So it really wasn't that difficult. Well, hey there, you guys are now on the screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll pull that back up. So anyway, that's what we have, um, kind of the general picture of how this is done. It's not that hard. I don't know. It is hard to keep up with it. Make sure that when you go to something like this, put it in my Vita, yeah. put it in your CV. Make sure that you keep track of stuff along the way. Because if you wait and you do that like in three years from now, it's completely overwhelming and you're not going to remember all of it. You're going to find yourself looking back through your old calendar from three years ago saying, what all did I go to? I have so, to say, I'm yeah. one that squawks about my Vita as being a pain in the neck. It On is. the other hand, when you want to pull together something like this, everything that you have actually remembered to put in there is all compiled for you very quickly and easily. So I guess it's not really as bad as I had maybe you know, given it credit for earlier. Um, okay, so now then, besides questions about kind of the general procedure, I really want us to dig in and take a look at your specific department procedures, and then also start taking a look at some of the others. And so I'm going to give you a few moments uh, to kind of dig through there and see if I did indeed pull one for your department. Okay? And then I'd like us to just kind of have a discussion about this, what things you think you need to do. 
But before we do that, I wanted to let Arena have a moment. So what I did here today for us is to brought the paint, you know, folders, the green, so we can, you know, take one each. And in this folders are the flyers for the activities that Cafe can offer you to enhance your promotion and pay your dossier. And I want to you know, take a few moments to talk about, you know, from, about Cafe activities from this particular standpoint. How to enhance your dossier. Um, first of all, what experience I have with NTTs. In 1997, when I came to this campus, I was actually hired as a lecturer. And I went through multiple promotions until 2005 when I switched from non-tenure track to tenure track, which is very unusual in academia. So it's safe to say that I know exactly what's happening for both tracks. So uh, that's one. And the second one, in the past decade or so, uh, being a tenured faculty member, I've been asked by multiple departments to serve on the uh, NTT promotion and tenure committees, that is to observe the teaching of NTT faculty and provide letter of, um, uh, what, what would we call it? A the report, a review, so to speak, you know, to enhance the dossier for NTT faculty. I do this for anyone, you know, tenure, non tenure, but again, I've done it for NTTs. And then, um, uh, in terms of enhancing your dossier, uh, there's several programs uh, in the folder that I can specifically point out to that can definitely beef up your dossier and make it kind of a pull together. So when we evaluate teaching, my recommendation is to go with the triangulation method. CET scores by themselves, they're just numbers. They don't give you the full picture of what's going on in your classroom. You don't, numbers mean not a whole lot if you don't place them in the proper context. So what I'm getting at is you need to paint the context of your class, of your discipline, of your class, and how specifically you achieve those numbers. In some situations, 3.1 can be viewed as, you know, bravo and applaud if you have a class with 300 students in it. And then, for someone who teaches a seminar with three individuals in it, 3.1 may not be as great. Class size matters. So, triangulation. What successful dossiers I've seen um, presented with the CET scores, with the full, you know, kind of a picture of what your classes are teaching, what the progression, how they tie together, if they do multiple sections, non-multiple sections, and so on and so forth. But then, teaching observation, done by somebody else who is impartial, and in fact, don't be afraid to go outside your own department, because the less we know about mechanical engineering, the better we are as evaluators will be focusing on what's really important and what makes you unique instructor. Student interaction, how you connect with your audience, and how you're able to convey your content to your students. So, teaching observation. And then the last one that Christy already mentioned is the teaching philosophy or a teaching statement or any document referring to what makes you unique in your approach to teaching practices. So if you paint that context for the faculty, excuse me, for the promotion and tenure committee, then whatever number you have with your CET will be highlighted in a certain way. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense or not. I'm gonna make a segue to mid-semester feedback. There is a great program that we implement that is called mid-semester feedback. In fact, we will be rolling it out in a couple of weeks. We're already finishing up the week four. So anytime from week six and up, it would be a good time to invite one of our instructional designers to administer mid-semester feedback in your classes. You don't have to do anything except for contacting us at cafe.msd.edu and express an interest. We have standardized questions that we use, and those are the same as the university uses on the final CET. And we have additional bank of questions that we can enhance your questionnaire with. 
You tell us which one you like, we put together the survey, it's all done digitally, it takes about 10 minutes in your class session, and then you get very, very well detailed statistical report and student comments that you can take in and make changes to your classes at the semester. So, I hope I'm not overextending you know, myself or overstaying my welcome. There are other programs outlined in that folder besides mid-semester feedback. I think teaching observation would be great, especially for those faculty members who would like an objective evaluation of what they do in the classroom and how they can enhance their teaching. Also, if you don't feel like being observed, we have a list of faculty members who don't mind letting you in into their classrooms to observe them. So there's again multitudes of options to enhance teaching and to better yourself and your techniques when it comes to teaching activities. Um, that's about what I was going to say. And um, last thing from junior, junior faculty standpoint, don't be afraid to ask. One thing I'd like to add to what Irina was saying about some of these programs you can participate in or activities you can do in your class or don't observe, don't just say in your CV, I observed so-and-so's class or so-and-so came to my class, here's their report. Talk in your narrative about how you use that to make changes in what you do because that's what your committees are going to look for. They'll say, oh sure, they went to all these talks about teaching, but do they do anything with it? That's what really matters is continuous improvement. That's what we're looking for. I think it's also important to really see when people are promoted, when they're promoted, you don't have to look good as a department member or a college member. You have to look good as an institutional citizen contributing overall to well-being of the students on this campus. Right? And plus, if you do research, so does your profession. That's what's really important. Right? Also, your name out there promoting this is okay. You can do the same thing if your research faculty that she's talking about is teaching Correct. faculty. Correct. Have people review your proposals, work with them on a more regular basis, not just an annual review, maybe more often, especially at the beginning. For research faculty in particular, if you wish to share your knowledge with junior faculty, for example, if you're an associate you know, teaching professor level, if you do research, it would be great for you to mentor somebody and, you know, and pass along the information on to them. So again, it's a, it's a culture of sharing. Not the silo mentality, but really thinking outside the box and being able to connect with different constituents on campus. Okay, I think I'm going to sit down and have some tea. <laughs> How's that? Okay, so, like I said, I have a lot of different statements in there. Um, I would like for you guys to take a moment and review those. Find your department, if possible, and then look and see what their promotion policies are. You may find you have some questions from that. Feel free to ask, I'll give you a moment. I'm gonna, uh, just because I have had one question, and that is that, okay, some of us have some unusual responsibilities. It's not strictly teaching or strictly research. We've got maybe a really heavy service load or some other responsibilities that we do. And your department should have written out what your responsibilities are, and that should be what you are evaluated on. Okay, so just because your service load is perhaps more than 50% of your responsibility, then that should be a very, very large part of what you're evaluated on. And the campus committee is supposed to check and make sure that that was indeed how you were evaluated. Have you had that come up? You've served on a lot of those committees. I've served on the committee every year. So, yeah, if you have a really heavy load, we're going to notice that in the campus committee at least, I hope your department does as well. How many of you guys actually have contracts? Does anybody not have a contract? No contracts? <laughs> Still it's a problem. Our contracts are supposed to be between one and three years and you should get one after your performance review and your raise letter comes 
out, right? You guys are working, it is September, we're getting paid, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. A couple weeks in a for sure. But I, with that, you should get a contract. Yes, I And the minimum is a one year contract, and they have to let you know at least, I think it's how long you would know. It's based on your how many years you've been here. Right, and so what your rank is. I'm not sure. Well, maybe that's my problem. I'm not sure if it's ranked, but I know it's based on how long you've been here. So if you've been here like five years or more, then it's supposed to be at least a year. Mm -hmm. uh, three, I want to say three. Three. Well, three years is the maximum contract. Mm -hmm. It's between one and three years yeah. as your contract length. So different departments are going to do it different ways. But your contract should say the duties. Yes? Okay, so if you don't have a contract, you should talk to your department chair and say, we're supposed to have contracts for NTTs. And that should come out with the raise letters. Um, what should There's a lot of shoulds in there. Oh, oh, yeah. We even brought this up with the, the Bean of Engineering a couple of yeah. years ago, and he didn't, I still have a contract. No, but he said that he, said he agreed that we should have contracts. Yeah. It's yeah. in the CRRs, and it's supposed yeah. to have. If my department didn't do this, I would be really pushy, but I tend to be like that and say, look, I need well, this. Yeah. I need this because I'm supposed to work next month and I'm not going to work with no contract. Give me something. Yeah. So Stephanie and Scott, since you guys have served on a lot of these committees, one question I have is I do one lecture class a semester, but then I have two to three labs. and do labs count? I mean, I do lab. Well, they don't count for see, for winning any kind of awards, or you can't count labs. Yes. Even and though I have lab lectures, huh? In promotions, we need labs. Right. You want to do a big chart of all the things you've done, and how, what classes specifically, the lecture, the lab, what type it is, how many students, and what your scores were, if those were available. And I pledged one of my labs. Right, yeah. And if you do something interesting, talk about that. Or if you have one semester that maybe you tried something new and it totally tanked and your students hated it and they gave you a 2.2 that semester, you want to explain that in your narrative. You don't just want to let it slide and hope, oh, well, I've got 50 others. They won't notice that. They won't notice that. That's for sure. So make sure you say something about that and what you did to fix it. And that especially is important when you're teaching a new class. Yes. With new class, if you're being assigned to teach a new class from scratch and those classes end with zero one, right, develop a new course, or you're a new person who just newly hired, this is your first teaching year at ST. If you have your scores 3.9, more power to you, but most people don't because it takes a while to get adjusted to our students, right? campus culture do that. So it has to be also explained. Yeah, remember, painting the context. Yeah. Don't expect the committee to make up a story for you, because they will, and it won't be as happy as yours. Yeah. Yeah. So make up your own story and tell them. I hope it's not made up, but let them know what the story actually is. Tell the story. Tell your story. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question, because it was one that came up with my promotion. <clears throat> about letters, letters of recommendation, and then the external letters that the department may or may not get. So what? Yeah, there are really two types of letters. There are support letters, which you can go out and solicit from as many people as you want, or you can say, okay, I got these cards and stuff from students. I'm going to make copies of them and put it in with my support materials. That's all fine. But the committee needs to know if this letter was solicited by you or not or what. So I know in mine, I put some extra categories. They had like S dash support letters or something. And I put S1 and S2. I just changed it. <clears throat> so it's OK to do that if you're doing it in a reasonable way, I think. Because I had some things that were unsolicited, but I just could not pass by when parents sent me something. Like, oh my god, parents sent me something being happy. I want them to see this. So I put in unsolicited stuff. And then I said, here are some letters from people around campus that I solicited. They wrote a letter for me, and that went in the, the support letter part. I had it in two pieces. 
Now, support letters are different from review type letters. <coughs> a review letter, when you go up for promotion, your chair is going to ask you to supply some names. And you will supply some names of people who you think would be competent to review your dossier. And also, your department committee will come up with some other names, and your department chair may come up with further names. And I'm going to say, in my department, <coughs> the candidate is not allowed to suggest any names. There's a bunch of names. <laughs> but there are and a bunch of names. They go through some of It has to be external to no. the university. I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. Okay, so there's a bunch of names. You got a bunch of names. And the chair and the department committee select people off of that list. Some will be, perhaps, names that you put forward. Like, I had somebody who I worked with in the business department 10 years ago that my committee would never have known, Morris. And he's a dean off in uh, Washington State or something now. And they would not have known that, but he and I worked very closely together. So I put him on my list and said, hey guys, here was our, how we worked together. And with my list, I said, this is what we did. This is how we knew each other and how we worked together. This is how we knew each other and worked together. So I gave him a list. So the chair of the department and the committee choose people off that list. Some will be people that you hadn't thought of that they did. Some will be people that you thought of. We try to, most departments are supposed to do a balance between those things. And it kind of works the same way with tenure track folks. <coughs> then your department chair will solicit a review letter from that person. All those people like six different people. So your department chair is going to send out usually an email asking these people to review your dossier. Now this is not your complete dossier. Early, there's an early date. I forget when it is. It might, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but the department chair has to solicit these, these letters. You can look at the Provost timeline. And it's good for you to have a very basic set of stuff ready to go then and not necessarily have it all perfect yet, but your basic CV and a list of courses you've taught, maybe your teaching statement. If you have at least rudimentary of that ready, it can go to those people that are being solicited to review you. And they will look over this stuff and they'll write up a summary of their thought and if they would promote you at their university or whatever. And those are review letters. It could be, and most of us, it's going to be people here. So a lot of these people are people here at s and that you know. Now this comes to where you were talking about, Joan. If you are going from assistant to associate, all of your letters could be from people from here. They could all even be within your department. Letters external to the department are required when you're going from associate to full. And that's part of what's stated in policy document 2-13. I don't know if it's explicitly in the CRRs, but I know it's in the policy document. Mm -hmm. Now, a department document could be more stringent than that, and they could say you have to have some letters external to your department, no matter what your promotion you're going out for. And in my department, for all promotions, it's external to the university. Yeah, and that's quite stringent, and I think, in general, a bit unusual. So. The basic rules are external to your department is required if you're going for full. And that's the only time. Now check your department document for differences. And yes, it can look good if you do get some outside of university letters. So that can strengthen your case. So part of why I wanted you guys to all have copies of all of these, you know, not all of the policies, but a lot of different policies, is so that you can look at these and go back to your department and make some suggestions of ways you might want to change things with some support that uh, other departments are doing it this way seems more reasonable. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and when I went to my department chair and said, hey, I'm thinking about going up for promotion, what do you think of that? And also, we don't have a department document. Could we get one ready in the next couple of months? And he looked at me and said, that would be a good idea. Someone needs to do that, pointedly. So if you have suggestions, be ready to hear that sort of response. Oh, well, that's a good idea. Why don't you do it? But remember, that's to your advantage. If you can set the rules in a reasonable way, go for it. Yeah, there are 
are some department documents out there that are really very skimpy. They just grab the, the chart from policy. Material the science, there's this literally it. the CRR pages. Yeah, a lot of them need a lot of work. And I think that's something that it would be really good to clean those up. If we can help you guys do that. And then some departments have documents that are you know, bricks. I think my department ended up with one like that. Um, business, I think, has right. one that's kind of a brick. Sort of. I think business is 22 <laughs> pages, but it incorporates all of their it, yeah. policies. Yeah. So it's a, it covers everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think my department's like probably four or six pages, something like that. Yeah. Ours started out more like yours, and then the <clears throat> tenured faculty got a hold of it and wanted it to match the other the tenure track document. I think your faculty need more work to do. So ours ended up very long. So yes. So our policy states that we have to submit a list of I think six uh, alumni who have taken courses from us. Uh, and I can already tell that that's going to be very hard to do. I mean, seven to four five years from now, tracking down those students. So I'm wondering if people have done this, if they had anything similar to this. What they've done, because it occurs to me that I should start collecting them now, but how would I do that in a way that is, you know, objective and so on? Um, I'm going to make a recommendation. LinkedIn is a really good way if you, like, occasionally post things on LinkedIn and tell your students you're going to do that, and then they will come find you. And... Okay. I have a different suggestion. I know that's part of my when a person goes for a promotion and tenure at the tenure level, right? So the department administrative assistant contacts every student this level class, and then they contact every student that they're taking that class, asking them to get the feedback. Well, statistically, if you contact the former students who already graduated, you get probably 30% response from that class of any given. Day. But again, what it accomplishes is not you have picking the people who speak on your behalf, but we contact them independently, and then we can trust the information that only we know you don't. Occasional students will say, okay, I got emails several times, I'm going to go try, you know, I've been informed you're going out for, you know, promotion, whatever, and I was asked to write a letter. Is it a legitimate request? I said, yes, go ahead and do it. So, but students sometimes unaware of how these things work. But again, it is best if your department gets, okay, this is my feature class, this is my specialty. Well, let's take a look. In the past three years, we contact everybody who's been enrolled into that class, and we get the feedback from that. It's more objective that way. Although in mine, I know I had, I don't know how many because they submitted it directly to my chair because I didn't want to touch it. Um, I had probably a list of six former students who have been in the Alumni Association. They come back to campus all the time. Yusha knows this. She probably knows who they are. But um, they'll come back to my office and visit me and they've been out for 10 years. So people like that, I did send an email and say, hey, this is happening. Would you be willing to write a support letter? And so I put that in as part of the support letters. But they were not considered to be like a review letter that was selected by the committee or anything. So you can still do that sort of stuff. And the committee isn't going to put that much weight behind it, but because it was solicited by you. But if it's something where you had some sort of particular relationship with that student and they went on to present at some conference and won a big award and they're attached to you, maybe it is worth putting that in there. So what I'm getting is that if you solicit it, it's not... It's not as powerful, but it is still an acceptable thing to put in there. But you need to designate, I solicited this letter. I didn't have any solicited letters. Um, I was just told it was kind of not worth the time, so I didn't bother. But Well, and it depends on your department. Yeah. So with the people in your department committee, maybe that was something you that, did not That was what I was told, is that my department did not value those. Okay. Well, I didn't know who my committee was, and I knew what I valued, so I put in what I thought <laughs> I wanted to put in. But as long as you're clear about where it's coming from, you don't want to present something as unsolicited when you went out and asked for it. 
So that would yeah, take your case a bit later on that. So. Good question about the role of educational research and how you form the that's the requirement of recommendation across the departments. In ours, at least, it, it appears to be in the promotion to associate requirements, but for the full, it actually just says that you either make it or apply it to your own teaching. So there's, I mean, at least in the way it's written, it looks like an hour that's required for associate but not the full. That's interesting. Uh, it's just a strain, yeah. it, but I've heard the opposite by word of mouth. So, yeah, some of those things you probably want to go back to your department and look clarify yeah. um, that maybe the rules for your department need to be updated. So do other departments require or recommend this as an iceberg or is it a required feature? It's on the list of these are some things that you should do some of these things and that's one of the things in this long list for my department. Yeah, it's always kind of a difficult situation on the research side for a teaching professor. So if you consider it to be, you know, scholarly work of some sort, that's great. So you're actually public. Well, in your packets in the green folder that I've disseminated, there are two programs that can help you with your research agenda if you are an FTT. One is educational research mini-grants that CAFE offers to everyone. And that is not research per se, like research faculty would do in the, in the specific field, but this is no less research because you get funded to investigate some teaching practices in your class and then publish it as a finding that everybody else can capitalize on. Another program that I strongly recommend to apply for is eFellow grants. That is specifically dealing with course redesign and it always reflects favorably on you as willing to take one step further to better your class environment. And also, it will look very prominently in your dossier, even three to five thousand dollars given to you to perform that type of research. Always speaks well. Uh, one of the elements of the e -filogram, it's mandatory for you to present your findings at one of the venues, either here at SNT or elsewhere. So participation in conferences, also very important, that can be viewed as one of the elements of your research. So there's varieties of ways to enhance your CV by soliciting grants and presenting at various venues with your findings. And I categorize those on my um, dossier under my service to the profession. So right. my professional okay. activities, that's where I categorize yeah. those. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to mention, having sat on the campus committee in the first times, is that something I look for when people are going from associate to full, is that they've somehow made a mark on the campus as a whole. That it's not just, I teach my class, I do a really good job with that, I do technology in my classroom, my students love me, and I'm on some committees. I want to see something that's a, a wider view of things. So eventually, not right away, but eventually, you probably want to try to get involved in something that's a little bit more bigger picture, that's benefiting the university as a whole, if you're going up for full. I think that does make a big difference when we look at your dossier. Questions? Yeah. I have a question about uh, student evaluations. So the ensembles are very different for most classes in that I have 10 kids in one orchestra, but I have 45 students who are in it. So is there a way to have those extra 35 students review me apart from the online way that they do it? Because what if those kids have really good things to say about me? And then the 10 who are in the from the standpoint of <clears throat> procedure of how to choose evaluations are administered on this campus, you go into QSS, whoever is on the roster gets that link and email to evaluate. If they're not on the official roster, they don't get that. So you're absolutely right. We can help you okay. to working with those students. 
For example, if you would like to do the mid-semester evaluation, and that is as good as anything else at this point, we can do that and you will have statistical data you can present pointing out that yes, those kids are not traditional animal students, but there is a massive number of them and here is what they said. I wonder if I could hook you up at the end of the semester with the folks who do those in IT okay. and get some like different category where it wouldn't be the official thing, but it could potentially be added in it. Because I have, it, did you guys know that you can be evaluated in the summer? Well, it's not a normal thing. Mm -hmm. you have let, to let you know. Yeah, you yeah. can be. If you let people know, they're very early. Yeah, to let them know super uh, early, though. No, don't. We want to hold a know. workshop kind of thing like this every semester, and I would like it to come from you all instead of from whatever you know comes out of my brain. <laughs> so. so there are other things. So like, I don't personally think the awards system is equitable. <laughs> yeah. So you get all these solicitations, nominate somebody for the teaching award, the service award, the research award, the overall excellence award, none of those. We're not eligible for any of those. We are eligible for the faculty achievement award. The dollar amount for that is less than any of the others. Also, with the others, say you could win a service award one year and a teaching award the next. With us, you can't win the achievement award twice in a row. So there's a lot of fishiness, I think, in there and not as much opportunity as I'd like to see. So that's sort of a pet thing of mine that I'd like to get fixed. I don't know what other things you guys have run into in the labs. Labs? Labs yes. accounting, like for, for um, teaching awards? Correct. Just for the not monetary, just the regular ones? Yes. The yeah. ones. Yeah. So then the CDTs, the labs are not factored in the means? What? Labs don't count. That's not right. Labs CDTs don't count. No, labs don't count. Yeah. Labs don't count. Don't count. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, since I served as a chair of CDT award committee in the last few years, I don't know they The cutoff score in the past few years was 3.6. So, your average CET score for a year, right? You take all the numbers, divide by numbers, sum it up to 3.6 or above. That's that's the margin that, that you know that, that's the group of people who is eligible for outstanding teaching award. And that is based on pure statistical data. Nothing else goes into that award. We get rosters and big Excel spreadsheets from uh, IT and that's it. So, Irina, is this a weighted average? So, a one credit class doesn't count as much as a five credit class. A does does a large class count for more than a small class? Is it per student? No, is no. It, it just here's the three classes you taught. We exactly. don't care how many students or how many credits. And it's the, just that year, not the previous year. It's not your just class. one academic year. So, but basically, this is yes. Yeah, this is this is well, okay. this is messed up. <laughs> this, is not, this, this is not this is not a piece of paper, right? So, but this is not the, the question for our community teaching award committee. We implement whatever you know standards right. we're passed. And it yeah. says someplace that courses that have extra large enrollments will be considered that that will be taken into consideration. And I have no idea what that means. I can tell you exactly what it means. Uh, in the past, before we went away with colleges, and that was in 2009, eight, close enough. Okay, so before that, each college had a specific award given to a faculty member whose classes were 100 plus in enrollment. So we had a special award, but then, Colleges went away, we just was left with department chairs, and then when the college has been reassembled, that award was not reconstituted. However, committee, CET committee, made at least two recommendations, and I know this because I wrote them, to revive that award. 
But again, it's the recommendation. We do not have power to approve, vote, or award <laughs> at this point. So we're working on it. Well, I would say the committee works on it. Uh, we'll see what happens. Is this something that would go to faculty senate? Uh, this will be correct. This would be to task the committee for the effectiveness of teaching associated with faculty senate to push that issue forward. Because we implement the rules that pass along to us. So I'm on the committee that will be receiving this from rules? Yes. When I was on the CDP for a long time, I, I was kind of thought there was the Tom Akers effect that was having, a, was having an impact on that because everybody would always say, we'd say, okay, but, but big classes, you know, there ought to be some sort of an adjustment for that. And somebody would say, well, look at Tom Akers. He just, you know, huge class and, and get great scores. So that obviously it has no impact, which that, that went on for years and years. Well, and also at that time, a big class was 100. That's true. Too. Now it's different. <laughs> Um, if you have other issues or concerns or, you know, just something that maybe irritates you and you'd like to probe a little further, if you want to, if you want to tell me about those later, you know, like when it comes up, like maybe right now you're like, no, no, everything's fine. And then, you know, later you're like, oh man, I forgot. This is really getting on my nerves that they do this to me as an NTT. Okay. At any time, if you contact me, I will then kind of put that together and...